from sunny St. Leonard's on the south coast of the UK, this is the Keto Woman Podcast. Brought to you by me, Daisy Brackenhall. Hello, Keto Lovelies, and welcome to episode number 205. This week, I'm back with my good friend Terry Lance for another Mindset Matters episode. This week, we throw some ideas around and some great advice from Terry about how to deal with discomfort, the discomfort we feel when making changes. You know, think of things like cravings and how difficult they are to deal with. It's certainly something that I struggle with. And so that's what we're talking about today. And I hope you find it as useful as I did. For once, the weather people told the truth and the weather has been glorious. It's been lovely and warm and sunny, blue skies and perfect swimming weather. In fact, I got in a moon swim yesterday evening and although we didn't see the moon when we were in the sea, it did make an appearance afterwards when we were getting changed. It was a really good turnout as well and there must have been at least 20 of us. If I hadn't have already dried off and got changed, I would have joined the intrepid half a dozen ladies that went back in when the moon did come up, starkers, maybe next time. But as it was, I had a great time. The tide was out. And so I also took advantage of that to do my third swim round the buoy, which was quite exciting in the dark. And I thought I would go for it and get up super early this morning and have a sunrise swim as well. And this time I actually did it. I've been promising myself I'm going to do a sunrise swim ever since I got here. And this is the first time I've done it. It does help that the sun rises a little bit later than before. So it wasn't too, too early. But still, my dogs did give me quizzical looks when I left the house at 6.15 in the morning. They were still fast asleep when I came back. And I pretty well turned straight round and took them out for a walk. It's quite nice going for a dog walk a little bit earlier. Got to meet a new set of people and dogs. And my two youngsters have been playing with a lovely puppy called Pablo the last couple of days. What else have I got to report? I'm just trying to think. Nothing much is happening here. My Dairy Free is still carrying on. Dairy Free and the cravings are getting fewer and fewer. I still get the odd intense pang for cheese, but apart from that, it's been okay. I've had to think of a few replacements here and there, but that's quite good because it pushes me to think up new things. And I've made a particularly delicious coconut ice cream. So it can be kind of fun when you restrict some of the foods that you eat all the time because it encourages you to think of new things to try. I've always liked coconut and I've never managed to figure out exactly how to replicate the most wonderful coconut ice cream I used to have when I went to Thailand to see my father every summer. I used to go every year from about the age of 11 every year while I was at school in the summer holidays and then at different times of the year depending what I was doing. But there was this one place that had the most delicious coconut ice cream. And try as I might, I've never managed to quite get that flavor. Of course, I don't know what their recipe is. I wish I did. But anyway, I have made a pretty delicious coconut ice cream that I've been enjoying. Oh, and the other good news is that I have potentially solved the builder problem I've at least got someone who's going to come and do the floors downstairs, which will mean I can move out of this room, which is serving. You don't know which room I'm talking about, of course, but this my living room, my bedroom. It's the room we spend most of our time in and it will become basically a storage unit But because I don't have enough space to move things around, I really need to get the downstairs done so I can move down there. And then, yes, this room will just become a storage unit, which will mean I can get all my stuff back out of storage and stop paying storage fees, which of course will be a good thing because it's dragged on for months and months and months now. And the bill, of course, keeps getting higher and higher. So hopefully within about a month, I'll be able to get my stuff back. I have to admit, I'm kind of dreading it because although I got rid of an awful lot of stuff, 
I ended up bringing way more than is going to fit into this place. And there's lots of stuff that I'm going to have to get rid of. And which, of course, I paid to move and I'm paying to store. But, you know, lessons learned and all that. Hopefully, because I haven't got anywhere to store these things now, it's going to encourage me to really whittle things down to somewhere near just the things I need. I have to say, having lived here for over six months now on very few things, it's made it very clear to me how much stuff you actually don't need. (laughs) But once a hoarder, forever a hoarder. Hopefully, I will learn to change my ways somewhat. I feel a little bit better about it now knowing that I can at least get the floors sorted. Everything else can wait if it needs to. It's not the end of the world. So that's it, I think. The dogs are all doing well. The cats are fine. The weather's nice. I'm hoping it's going to last for at least another week or two. They did promise until the end of September. So we shall see. I hope wherever you are in the world, you're looking forward to a nice weekend. And if you are struggling with changing something in your life and going through some discomfort, hopefully this chat that I had with Terry will be of some use to you. I'll see you back here afterwards. Welcome back, Terry, to another Mindset Matters episode. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thanks for having me back. I always look forward to these now that it's just an extension of us getting to talk about things that we enjoy talking about. It is. I was just saying, I have to figure out which I'm so used to my Monday mindset head. So I had to (laughs) change it over when I see you there on the screen with me. It's usually Monday mindset. And it's not a big shift. It's just a slight shift to one side. So what I thought would be nice to talk about today, it's something that I struggle with, and I'm sure other people do, is learning how to embrace the discomfort that comes with change. Like I say, it's definitely something that I struggle with. I don't like to be in that feeling of discomfort and always try and avoid it or get away from it. But I have a feeling there is lots of potential to be had in learning how to embrace it. So Mm. I thought you would probably have some words of wisdom on that subject. Well, it's kind of funny, just our process so far is you pick a really cool topic, and then um, we didn't have much time ahead of time to check in about what we would talk about today. But I think when it comes to things like this, I always have something I can pull from just based on, you know, the work that I do and the work that I've done in the past. So this is a a topic that's, I think, right up my alley, something that I love talking about with people. So I think it's a great choice. It reminds me a lot of an episode of a, I guess it was just an interview I listened to. And there's a really great book that I talk about a lot in the fasting method community where I work. And it's a book written by an author named Glenn Livingston. And the book is called Never Binge Again. And it's not only talking about what some of us might think of how we would define binge eating, like eating an excessive amount of food, but really in his definition of binge is anytime we're eating kind of off plan. So it's a great book, really useful way to think about things. But in the audible version, in the after credits, which is about seven hours of listening, there is an interview that he does with another psychologist. And he brings up a concept that Freud came up with. I think he called it beyond the pleasure principle. And he said, you know, in general, we're pretty motivated in two ways. We're motivated to avoid discomfort and pain, and we're motivated to seek comfort and pleasure. Mm. And so I think when we think about people changing how they're eating or trying to sustain a dietary approach change that they've made, it's a big piece that we can't keep seeking pleasure. If I used to seek pleasure in eating cookies and I no longer eat sugar and flour, that old strategy doesn't work. Or likewise, as you and I have talked about getting ready for this a little bit, if I eat something that's problematic, 
because I'm feeling down or frustrated or sad or lonely, I'm doing that to avoid pain. And so in this little interview that Glenn Livingston did, he really emphasized the fact that it's a stretch for many of us to really think about living beyond the pleasure principle, that we can do things that are uncomfortable, we're perfectly capable of it, and we can avoid things that are pleasurable that don't serve us well. I was thinking about an example more to address the wanting to avoid discomfort, because I think that's why a lot of us struggle with wanting to eat foods that we no longer consider part of our options. I came up with this example of if you've ever had poison ivy, and it itches really bad, but you know if I scratch it, it's going to spread. It's going to be worse. It's going to open it up. It's going to spread So now instead of having it just on my hands and my arms, I'm going to have it on my chest. I'm going to have it on my legs. But it's so uncomfortable that you want to scratch it to make it stop. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a good example in my mind to think about navigating the physical desire, emotional desire to feel differently versus the reality of the outcome of doing it. And so having to kind of sit on, you know, maybe you have to sit on your hands so that you don't scratch, but it's really learning to kind of be in the discomfort because you know that if I do the step that I think would help me feel less comfortable, it will actually make things worse. And sometimes the consequences are different than what you're already experiencing, but they're negative consequences. So I think for me, that interview really just reminded me of, we don't always get to do the fun things. You know, if the circus comes to town, you don't always get to go to the circus. Or if something's uncomfortable, you still have to do it. Mm. I think this is an important reminder for me and a lot of people working on their dietary approach. Not facing it from the, oh, but I want it. It's so good. Or oh, I'm feeling so uncomfortable, I have to erase it with this thing. So to me, his interview is a really good one on both sides. Not just seeking pleasure to feel good and not just avoiding pain to get out of the discomfort. So I I think that's kind of a base of this topic for me when you first mentioned it. It's hard, isn't it? Because nobody likes to feel that discomfort. Mm -hmm. It just reminds me of that. I know it's different for everybody, but it's a kind of, I always feel like I have to sort of psych myself up to make a change. I sort of have to be prepared for it. And it's often why it gets put off and put off for one reason or another. Um, But so Currently, I'm trying a period of going dairy free because I know full well that dairy impacts me negatively and I want to figure out exactly how bad that impact is and if it's all dairy or just some dairy. And the only way I can do that is to not have any dairy for a month or so Mm -hmm. and then test a few things and see how I go. But it's really difficult. And my tendency is always to try and avoid that feeling of discomfort, avoid those cravings. Mm. The cravings have been really quite powerful. So I tend to replace it with something else. So I've been eating too many nuts Mm. and those kind of things. No dairy. I've done very well. I've completely ticked that box. I haven't had any dairy, but I've sort of replaced it with something else. Mm -hmm. But what that feels like to me is that I'm just pushing that discomfort down the line because I know that it's not going to be a case of then swapping that back out again for the dairy. I know that I'm overdoing Mm -hmm. the nuts, the nut butters, the seeds I've been making granola, that kind of thing. I'm going to have to psych myself up and stop that as well. And it it feels like I just keep pushing it Mm -hmm. down the line. It feels like on one hand, it's a step forward because I've got over the dairy-free hurdle. Mm -hmm. That's difficult, got those cravings, and I've got past that. But 
I've just sort of replaced it with something mm-hmm. else. <laughs> yeah, the way you're describing it reminds me of just really thinking of it. It's like replacing one vice with another vice. Mm. And in general, vice means it's it's also problematic for us. And so, okay, I'm willing to let this vice go. So now I'm going to lean more heavily on this vice. And then when I have to get on to letting go of that vice, that's okay. Because I'll just turn to another one. <laughs> I'll replace that with another thing that gets in my way or holds me back. Um, and so I think that is an important thing to think about with this if we are kind of substituting for something that we're working maybe to let go of or not engage in, are we substituting with another vice that's also then going to be further complicating things? Mm. But you know, Daisy, I think one of the important things that you just acknowledge you struggle with, I know I struggle with, so my guess is anyone who's listening to this episode struggles at some level with this. It's called discomfort for a reason. It is not comfortable. Mm. And we have really been kind of indoctrinated to seek comfort and gear our lives in ways that provide comfort. And so emotionally to be in a place that doesn't feel good, to feel frustrated, lonely, having a craving, you know, there's physical even sensation with that it goes against what we've really kind of learned to do in our lives is avoid that uncomfortable feeling, whatever it is, and replace it, escape it, avoid it, whatever, by doing something else. So if it's emotional pain, we eat. If it's a physical sensation, like I've got a craving, well, I'll just eat something better or something that's not in that category. And it reminds me a little bit of Robert Sivas, who does a lot of talking about this as far as carbohydrates and processed food that oftentimes we're using those as an emotional regulation system. But I think really learning how to change this for ourselves involves something that some of us don't find really simple to do. And that is sitting with that discomfort, slowing down and even acknowledging that it's happening Because a lot of times we engage in a behavior before we even are aware why. So first to sit with the feeling, acknowledge it. And I think the power comes in when we can label it and say, ah, I'm feeling a craving or I'm feeling angry or I'm lonely. So feeding any one of those things with a problematic food or another food is not actually addressing the need, what would be addressing the need? Which explains why you keep having to go back and back and back because it's not actually satisfying the need. Yeah, it just escalates for most of us. And so instead to look at, okay, if I'm lonely, then I can actually work on what do I need right now to feel more connected? What do I need right now to enjoy my own company more? Eating... Or for you, you know, having ice cream right now because for you it's not dairy right now or having eliminating dairy, that has nothing. That's not going to help resolve the feeling of loneliness. It's going to numb you Mm. from that discomfort for a really brief time. But the underlying feeling will still be there. And I know at some level we all know this. You know, we're smart. We know this. But our body, our mind is very geared to handle it this way. Avoid the discomfort. Seek the thing that will change our emotional state. And then we'll figure out what to do next. But like you said, that just keeps that pattern going. Versus if I can pause here and say, ah, I'm angry. I need to identify some coping skills with anger that don't involve dairy or eating potato chips or whatever our our challenge is, that's actually then resolving the issue longer term to really get to what's under it rather than hide it, evade it, or escape it. It's really addressing what's going on that's causing the discomfort. Mm. I wonder if there's also some merit in the way you look at the actual physical discomfort just something that came to me 
that most people find quite easy to reframe. So if you've been doing a new exercise routine or just a new form of exercise or like me moving a load of heavy parts of a shed (laughs) from one part to another, it was, you know, heavy lifting and I can feel some soreness already in my muscles and I know probably the chances are good when I wake up tomorrow morning, my muscles are going to feel very sore. Now that's physical discomfort, right? It's not a comfortable feeling. However, unless it's, you know, really, really so uncomfortable that you're finding it difficult to move, if it's just a general feeling of discomfort, you know, they feel sore. But most of us anyway, are very good at reframing that. But yes, it's a good soreness because I've used those muscles, you know, or whatever it was, maybe you've just started a workout at the gym or you've just started mm-hmm. swimming or you've just started cycling or running or, you know, weightlifting, whatever it is, you feel good about that discomfort because you know it's something that's doing you good mm-hmm. overall. And I wonder if there's something in that. I wonder if we can somehow use that that I think is a reframing that most of us are familiar with and probably quite well practiced with. I wonder if there's a way of using that when it comes to embracing the feelings of cravings, for example, Mm -hmm. that so many people, myself included, find it almost impossible Mm -hmm. to ignore. I think it's really important what you're really identifying in my mind is accepting what it is and normalizing it. It is normal that if I've not been going to the gym and I go and do a heavy lifting session, my muscles will be sore. And I probably did that with the intention of defining my muscles or building my muscles. So they have to be broken down a little bit first. So that pain is a natural part of the benefit that I'm getting from it. And so accepting the discomfort and normalizing it. So if I've been eating dairy for months or years and I decide to stop, of course I'm going to have cravings. There's not a weakness in me because I'm having cravings. And that doesn't mean I have to act on it. I can acknowledge it, accept it, and normalize it. In a a less description of discomfort, I have an example of I do fasting right now on alternate days. So on an eating day, my morning coffee has really yummy things in it. I put cacao butter. I put some cream in there. I put some brown butter ghee. It tastes delicious. And then on a fasting day, I drink black coffee. And I don't really like black coffee. But what I have to do is frame that to myself. Of course, my coffee tastes different today. It's a fasting day. Instead of kind of giving into that kind of pouting 10-year-old inside of me that's saying, but this doesn't taste as good. (laughs) I want that yummy stuff that I just remind myself, yeah, it's a fasting day. It's okay that it tastes different. And in this example, I'll have that other coffee again, but not right now. And so I think, again, just reframing, accepting that having the experience is normal and we can do it, which I think is another huge topic on this and one that I never really thought of a lot until I read the book, It Starts With Food, when I did my first Whole30. They talk about in there the idea that we can do things that are hard. Hmm. And if anyone here has ever done a Whole30 or even just starting keto, similar kinds of things. But, you know, they say, look, people say, oh, I can't do this. It's too hard. I want to eat pancakes. And one of their rules is not only do you not eat flour and sugar, but you also don't make substitutions. And so, of course, people are like, that's too hard. I can't not eat pancakes. And they said, listen, birthing a baby is hard. (laughs) Fighting cancer is hard. And I use the example, watching someone you love die is hard. Yet we do those things when they happen in our lives. You know, people do these things every day. 
we can do things that are hard. Not having pancakes doesn't really compare. So I think it's also about not hyping up the difficulty so much to ourselves. Mm. Again, I feel like that 10-year-old when I start to get in that place, like, yeah, but I want it. It just would, it sounds good right now. And I'm so tired of not having it. Terry, you can do hard things. You're okay. You can handle this rather than I need to fix it. I need to give into it. And I wonder if there's something in there about thinking of an example where you have overcome a challenge that really is a big, big challenge. It's difficult, isn't it? Because I think the whole comparison thing is dangerous Mm -hmm. in the sense that, you know, what you're feeling is very real in that moment and it can feel like an insurmountable thing, this craving that you have Mm -hmm. for whatever it is and you can't stop yourself going back and having more. And and then, yeah, you know, there is the 10-year-old and all the rest of it. But I wonder if there's something about thinking about a time when you have overcome something Mm -hmm. really, really challenging Mm -hmm. and difficult and thinking about the strength that you found to do that. Absolutely. And trying to apply it in this situation. Absolutely. In the fasting method community, I love when people who have gone through a sobriety you know, experience, talk about that when they had to give up smoking or they had to give up drugs or alcohol. Of course, at the time that didn't feel possible. Just like giving up bread didn't feel possible to me. And they can say, I know I will see to the other side of this. It's challenging right now. This is new. I've been using that as a coping mechanism for years or maybe my entire life but I know what I can do. I can do things that are hard. And again, then I have to remind myself, one, most of these things get easier over time. I do not struggle with not eating bread the way I did in the beginning. Mm, Doesn't mean I don't still want bread at times, but the intensity of that desire has turned down immensely, but it wouldn't if I kept fueling it. Mm. And I think that's, a challenge for so many of us in this, you know, low carb or keto community is if we keep fueling the thing that we're really trying to change, we're keeping it around just enough to keep those cravings strong enough to make it more difficult. Mm. So like if you said, I'm not doing dairy except once a week, I'm going to have ice cream. Oh, that wouldn't work. <laughs> it would be really hard to ever stop, right? Yeah. No, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it does get easier over time. Mm-hmm. The cravings do start lessening. But I think that there's also something isn't there about the frame of mind. It's a bit like I was saying about having to psych myself up. Sometimes there's a kind of pleasure in the discomfort. Mm-hmm. There's a kind of pleasure you feel if you, you know, you really feel geared up for doing some fasting, for example, Mm -hmm. and the discomfort that you get from the growling your stomach's doing and the hunger pangs. But there's some kind of almost, I guess, a slightly masochistic element to it, maybe. But there's there's some pleasure to be gained in that discomfort, a bit like the muscle soreness, I guess, Mm -hmm. in that you know it's all part of growth and development and it's a good thing you're doing Mm -hmm. and you can actually derive some pleasure from it. Mm -hmm. But if you're feeling in a much weaker, vulnerable state, it's you can't get that same feeling from it. Mm -hmm. It just feels horrible. I think... You bringing that up, I was just thinking of another piece of this. It ties in with knowing we can do difficult things, things that we really value. That feels good. I say I want to get healthier and I'm eating in a way that's healthier for me. That's inspiring. I feel proud of that. It builds that momentum. The other thing I think is important for people is, um, I think you and I talked about this before in Monday Mindset when we talked about stress. Kelly McGonigal's book about stress, things that 
are important to us, are of value to us, usually bring some stress. Mm. So those people, neither you or I have this, but those people who have raised children or have kids living at home, a lot of stress people talk about is their kids. They wouldn't trade them in though. Like that stress is worth it because things that we really value bring us challenges. Mm. And so again, it's not getting rid of the stress she talked about. It's not getting rid of the stress. It's instead recognizing this is because this is really important to me. And so again, kind of like what you're saying, it kind of gets motivating. Like I did this yesterday. I was having a very stressful day and I was fasting and I got to a point at about two o'clock, like, oh, I just want to eat now. I can't do this anymore. And then I said, wait, of course, things I care about are stressful. Getting through this fast is really important to me for my health. And I'm dealing with these other stresses. I can handle this one. I've got this one. This one, you know, it actually started to feel empowering to be able to keep fasting. Mm, something that you can control, yeah. Yeah, which is another way to handle stress, Mm. finding what you can control about it. And I could control how I talk to myself about it. I could control that, um, maybe not control, I could kind of soothe that inner 10-year-old who said, I'm tired of this, I just want to eat, to say, I hear you, I know, but you've done really well so far today. In a few hours, it's going to be time to go to bed you can do this for a few more hours. You've got this. And that gave me that energy to keep going and feel good about accomplishing it. I think oftentimes we give up just before we get mm. over the hump. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. And I think it's in the book that I'm listening to at the moment with, is it Judson Brewer, the one that I'm reading at the moment? Yes, The Craving Mind. The Craving Mind, that's right. Mm -hmm. And he talks about this ebb and flow, this hump that you have to get over. Mm -hmm. And like you say, that point that you give in, especially if you've been sort of trying to use willpower and fight yourself over it, if only <laughs> you're just about cresting the wave there, if you could just ride it for a bit longer mm-hmm. and then you'd be down the other side. And you just highlighted a really important part of that cycle. James Clear and BJ Fogg, both who have written books about habit change, talk about the importance of celebrating the small steps. If I stop just before I get over that hump, I don't have anything to celebrate. But if I can go one or two more steps and get over that hump, now I can see that I'm on the other side and I can affirm myself for the accomplishment. I can celebrate that I got there. And that's how we build the habit. Mm-hmm. We, we reinforce it positively. And going back to your other example, we now use this to help us know we can do it again in the future. So next week, if I have a difficult moment while I'm fasting, I can say, oh, Remember last Wednesday when, you know, you're having this crisis in your apartment? Remember, you got through that without breaking your fast and you did it well. You can do this again. Mm. It just starts to reinforce itself. That's right. And you only have to do it once. So instead of being that, you know, one of these phrases that people come out with, it's always, you know, I always fall down when Mm -hmm. such and such is around. You know, I can never resist such and such. Well, you've only got to resist it once. And suddenly it's not never anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, I did it that time. Mm -hmm. Maybe I could do it this time as well. Mm -hmm. Daisy, I think that is so important. And this, again, it's a reference back to Glenn Livingston. The book is Never Binge Again. He also has a podcast. But he uses the example of when we start talking to ourselves about, I never do that. I can never do that. I never succeed when I do this. He said, wait a minute. That kind of goes with the idea that if you haven't been able to do something before, you won't be able to do it in the future. And he said, think about things in your life that you couldn't do at one point and then you could. So if you think back to like a toddler learning how to walk, you don't say to a toddler, oh, never mind. You can't walk. Mm -hmm. Sit down. You've never been able to walk before. Don't even try it. No. You see that they stood up and you're like, oh, there it goes. You got it. 
move your foot. Yeah. We can do things that we haven't been able to do in the past unless we tell ourselves we can't. So if, if we say, I can't sit with people eating a dessert and not eat it, well, there you go. Guaranteed, you won't be able to. Mm. But if you say, hey, I haven't been able to do that in the past, but I certainly can work on doing it now. I can build that skill. And once I do it once, like you said, I now have a new piece of information. I have sat with people eating dessert and didn't have any. Kind of throws a monkey wrench in that I can't do it mentality. Mm. And it's also, it's those little steps. There's a great image about teaching the toddler to walk. And that's not something I have any experience with, but it, I always like to bring things back to dogs. But it is kind of a similar, mm. it's a similar thing. I've been reading a very interesting book about the psychology of dogs. And they're talking about when you're training a new behavior. Mm. So it is very apt here. But they're saying the way that you do it is to get right back it's breaking it down into tiny, tiny steps. So if, for example, you're wanting to teach a dog to sit, you have a whole load of a high value reward treat and you reward every tiny little movement mm -hmm. to start with that is going towards the behavior that you want them to do. So with the toddler, you wouldn't just reward them when they're suddenly walking you'd reward all the tiny steps mm -hmm. towards that, all the tiny, just that movement that they're, and you get to be familiar with the movement that's the movement before mm -hmm. they go to stand up and take some steps. It's the look that they're about to. You mm -hmm. start rewarding those things and it's the little steps and it's the building blocks. So I think that's the thing. So you don't necessarily have to do it all in one go, but every bit, every small mm -hmm. step that you've got towards doing it once. It just takes away from that. Oh, I can never do this. Mm -hmm. Or, oh, I always end up falling off mm -hmm. when it's Christmas or, you know, whatever it is. These black and white, never, always. Yeah. I think Glenn Livingston's actual example was potty training. <laughs> and it would be like saying, never mind. You've always gone in your diaper. There's no sense even trying this. No. And think about that example. At some point, none of us were potty trained, but we do it quite well now. Mm -hmm. So yeah, usually, <laughs> usually <Depends>. to, use <laughs> the, <laughs> to use that statement, I can't do it because I've never been able to before. Mm. I haven't done it in the past, so I don't think I can do it. It's just selling ourselves short. We might need to work on developing the skills. We might need to develop the confidence, but... I really encourage people to be careful not to already limit themselves by saying they are unable to do something simply because they haven't been able to do it in the past. Mm -hmm. And I know we've gotten a little more away from that idea of sitting with the discomfort, but I get kind of excited talking about this. And one way that we talk about this kind of led to another thing, but I hope that this is helpful for people to really keep looking at ways to address their mindset. And I think so often we're taught to be really focused on our behavior, but behavior change doesn't happen if our beliefs are working against it. Mm. If I believe I can't go without dairy because I've always fallen back on dairy in the past, I'm going to have to work awfully hard on those behaviors. I need to also work on the belief changing. No, yeah, that's right. Well, I think that's great. I think we've rambled about all over the place like we tend to do. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm hoping people at home have found it as useful as I have, just working through a few things and some ideas and like you say, some different ways to start thinking about it and to stop putting limits on yourself because mm -hmm. you can do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what it comes down to. Absolutely. And allowing yourself, it sounds weird to say it's swimming, but allowing yourself the space to sit with discomfort, it won't kill you. It will be uncomfortable. 
but we can do uncomfortable things. We can do difficult things. It's actually what helps us grow and develop. We actually don't grow and develop from the easy, fun pieces. We grow from the challenges. And so even to reframe this, I want this stuff in my coffee today, but I'm growing. I'm developing a new skill today. I'm expanding my horizons and just really use this mindset shifting to help. And as we both identified, things do get easier over time because we turn down the volume on the limits that we're talking in our head and we've been reinforcing the behaviors. Yes, I think I definitely think there's some comfort in that thinking about the growth potential. Mm. So yes, I will be focusing on that. Well, you know how we wrap up the show, Ms. Lance. Yeah, she's making a face at me now. <laughs> I'm going to remember one of these times we record that this is coming. <laughs> Could you please leave us with a top tip? And we only need one top tip, please, even though you've provided us with many already. I think an important tip that I would encourage people to take with them is before you get to a point where you want to act on this discomfort or you even experience it, think of some healthy coping mechanisms you have available to you so that when you come to this point of tension that you want to alleviate by eating something problematic or, you know, doing something that's problematic for you is now you have a list of options of other ways you can cope. You do not have to turn to that old reinforced thousands of times coping strategy. You can use one of these from your list. But if you leave yourself in that uncomfortable situation and don't have ideas about what else you could do, you're more likely to keep falling back on the same old pattern. So make yourself a list of some ways you can cope with those moments. Perfect. Well, until next time, (laughs) I'm falling into the (laughs) Monday (laughs) mindset way to end of having a great week. You too, Daisy. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure as always, Terry. Thank you. I had a great time being here today. Thank you. Thank you for staying with me right to the end. I do hope you enjoyed our chat and will find it helpful. This week's end quote is from an unknown author. If you want to change, you have to be willing to be uncomfortable. It's difficult, isn't it? Nobody really likes to be uncomfortable, but hopefully you've taken away some tips from this week's episode that might help with that. Until next time, please take very good care And I'll see you soon. Bye-bye, Keto lovelies.